at the end of the session, okay? But right now, I just want to uh, connect directly to what from what we did last week into what we're going to do now, which will be our last uh, session of presenting a new meditation. So last week, we uh, I introduced a, a kind of meditation of compassion, which is called taking our our own layers of suffering into compassion. And in your meditation handout that you have available on your course website. That's meditation number seven. So taking our own layers of suffering into compassion, which is what we explored last week, last Thursday, is, is really an amazing practice, I think. It's derived from Tibetan mind heart training practices, but it involves, we experience our own layers of painful feeling or difficult feeling, but as we're experiencing them, our experience is reframed. So it's not experienced anymore as a sense of being isolated in our own pain. The experience uh, of our own layers of suffering is reframed as a basis of empathy and compassion for many others who have similar layers of suffering. So it's an amazing thing really to discover our own layers of suffering that are shared with many, many other humans that are part of our common humanity. To rediscover our own painful feelings as deeply connecting us to others and profoundly meaningful as a basis for compassion, rather than thinking of our painful feelings as we often tend to do as just meaningless and disconnecting. That's what's so amazing about it. But the practice of last week, taking our own layers of suffering into compassion also builds on the prior practices. So it's assuming that, that the practitioner has done lots and lots and lots of repetition of the prior practices, especially the first meditations establishing a really secure core of love and compassion. And on the basis of that, of that secure core, then we can come into extending love to others in a deeply discerning way that's sensing much more in them than our own reductive or surface impressions of them. And we have the confidence to sense more in others, much more than even our own reactions to them. That confidence comes from having first, having established a secure core, a secure base in love and compassion from which we can then come into the world. You following what I'm saying? And indeed, that is how all these contemplative traditions have worked. And I emphasize it because it is so little emphasized in so many meditation programs. The fact that a secure core is first established in love and compassion. That's often initially established by experiencing ourselves as held in a whole field of love and compassion. Like by the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas or by all the saints. But here we adapted that so that anybody with a strong enough interest can find their connection to that way of practicing, like with an, a caring moment from our own lives or a benefactor, someone we're grateful to who's been in our life, or of course, a field of spiritual figures or a lineage, if that's what we're also practicing, if that's what we're practicing in. But based on that secure core of love and compassion, which is not just external to us, that field of care evokes the powers and qualities of love and compassion from our own awareness. And so that secure core of love and compassion is a core, is an inner secure base. It's not external to us. In the field of care type of meditation, it's evoked from out of us, evoked from us, from our awareness this power of love and compassion. And it's with that power that we then come into all the other meditations, including the one last week in which now we have the power, we have the secure base necessary to be newly introduced to our own layers of pain and suffering and newly discover them as totally different from what we thought they meant or were. We had thought that our own painful feelings were ours and about us. They were never primarily about us. That's what we discover in the meditation I introduced last week. Our own painful feelings and layers of suffering are about everyone. 
that's what we had not noticed. And that's the brilliance of this direction of practice, which again is adapted from traditions of Buddhism, but that also bridges into and connects to many other spiritual traditions. Now the next meditation, oh, also I wanted to say that as we discover that our own layers of suffering, like feelings that are profoundly shared with many others, like feelings of loneliness, of grieving over loss, uh, fear for our loved ones, fear for our own lives, these are shared human feelings. And so when we recognize that as I experience one of those feelings, I am experiencing what many others feel in their own ways. It is so profoundly connecting. There's such a sense of solidarity with others. And that breaks down our reductive or limiting impressions of others by sensing them all as harboring hidden layers of suffering like ourselves. Our superficial impressions of others, just a stranger, just an old guy, just an old woman, just a girl, just whatever, just a dog even, but our superficial impressions, socially conditioned, utterly superficial labeling, labels that we mistake for the full person. We're not usually conscious enough to even notice we're doing that just start to break down because we're sensing others as harboring layers of layers of suffering that bring a gravitas to the encounter with anyone, including a stranger. So there's an awful lot that was embedded and implicit in the meditation I introduced last week. And now I'm gonna introduce a, a second meditation on compassion called bringing out a strong will of compassion for action. And that's in your handout, it's meditation number nine. And this meditation that we're about to enter into makes us much more fully present to others suffering, but in a way that avoids getting overcome by their suffering or overcome by our own suffering at empathizing with them. We become present to others suffering in a way that we don't have to get overcome by it or think that we have to turn away from it. You know, like some, so I hear so many people say, I, can't, I cannot watch the news anymore or I stopped reading the newspaper because there's too much suffering. So this is a practice that can help us feel, recognize we, don't have, we do not have to turn away. We do not have to hide that way from the suffering realities of our world. The way this works is that, uh, again, with our field of care practice, we've been learning to establish a secure inner core of love and compassion. And with that secure core in place, then our awareness of others suffering can fuel a power of empathy and compassion for them that does not get overwhelmed or depleted and that can generate a very strong motivation for action. So let me back up a little bit and say a little bit more about compassion. This is just very briefly, we'll start the meditation actually quite soon. Compassion, I have to say this part though, compassion includes empathy. Empathy means sensing or sensing or imagining or resonating with others in their suffering. So compassion includes empathy. It, it empathizes with others who are suffering and, and wishes them free of it so they can be well. And again, the empathy of compassion is resonating with others in their suffering and sensing what it must feel like for them to experience that or imagining how it must be for them. Now there's another term here that needs to be raised up and that is empathic distress. So what's called empathic distress occurs when we're empathizing with others who are suffering and we turn inward upon ourselves and get caught up in the pain of our own empathy for them. You follow? Empathic distress is when we're empathizing with others who are suffering 
And then our attention turns inward on ourselves and we get caught up in the pain of our own empathy for them. And repeated empathic distress, experience of empathic distress among caregivers of all kinds. So now this is really relevant to our situation, frontline healthcare workers, social workers, therapists, counselors, ministers, police officers. So repeated experience of empathic distress in caregivers often leads to emotional exhaustion and burnout. So for this reason, many people in caregiving fields, doctors, nurses, others, uh, psychologists, psychotherapists, even as part of their training, this is especially true I've heard of, of medical schools, are even told basically to suppress their feelings, just distance yourself from your feelings and don't over empathize so you can remain professional and got, not get emotionally exhausted and overwhelmed by all the suffering you're facing. And so what we're about to enter into is really relevant to the situation that so many frontline workers are in. In the meditation that I'm going to introduce now, we learn how to avoid empathic distress. We learn how to avoid empathic distress. Even as we are empathizing with others, in their suffering. But we avoid empathic distress even while empathizing with them by letting the power of love and compassion from our secure core guide our empathic attention compassionately outward, always toward the others. So our attention never turns inward upon ourselves in the pain of our own empathy. Instead, as you'll hear it in the instruction of the meditation, it's very explicit. Don't get stuck in the pain of your empathy. Well, empathize. But then while you're empathizing, don't get stuck there in the pain of your own empathy. But let your experience of empathy, even painful empathy, energize your compassion. So it becomes an intense, powerful, wish and energy of compassion directed outward toward the others who are suffering. So we do not internalize suffering as empathic distress, but instead become much more fully present to the others who are suffering and ready to respond. The instruction explicitly points out, do not go down the path of empathic distress. Not in those words, but it points it out in a more direct way. Do not go down that path of empathic distress, of turning inward on your own pain of empathy. You don't have to, you have a choice here. You can take even the pain of your empathy for others who are suffering and let that become an intense energy of fuel, of compassion, wishing them deeply free, ready to respond to them. So there are two key purposes of this meditation. One is to develop, develop skill at channeling empathy into compassion instead of empathic distress. The second is to bring out a very strong willpower of compassion for action. So in the next meditation that I'm gonna lead, we'll begin with our field of care to reestablish our inner secure base of love and compassion. Our inner secure base is not the field of care itself. It's what the field of care evokes in us. It's the qualities of spaciousness and acceptance and warmth and care and love and compassion and so forth that are evoked are brought forward from our, fun, from our own basic awareness by inhabiting a field of care. That's our inner secure core of love and compassion. So that's going to be our starting point as it is with the various meditations we do. So please be ready when instructed to re-inhabit a caring moment that makes you really happy to recall or to evoke a benefactor that you are grateful to have in your life as present here now with you. 
or to evoke a spiritual figure or lineage that is deeply meaningful to you so that you experience yourself as held in a field of love and compassion. So which of those three options is most effective to help you sense that you are held now in a field of love, care, and compassion? Caring moment or a benefactor from your life or a spiritual figure or a group of figures? Which of those three options to establish a field of care is most connecting for you to help you sense you are held now. You are held now in a field of absolute love and care and compassion. You are. Because those powers are in your fundamental awareness and this field is gonna bring them out. And that is all gonna be here now for you. If you're receptive enough to it. Whichever of those three options is the best for you right now, use that one in the meditation. Okay, so far? Now, after that, you're going to be asked, or I'll ask you, to bring to mind someone or some group whose suffering deeply touches your heart, such that you cannot bear that they have to experience that. So you may think of someone in your family or your community who has experienced suffering. Or you may think of someone or a group anywhere that you've heard about, anywhere, whose suffering really moves you. You really wish they did not have to experience that. You really want them to be free of that and its causes. So someone or some group like that for you. Try to think of that. Okay. Okay, so let's go ahead and sit in a relaxed way. Back comfortably straight, eyes can be open, gazing downward. You can close them if you feel a need. And then just let your breath settle into its own natural rhythm. And you're breathing into the abdomen, which means you feel the abdomen expand as you inhale. Really feel it expand on the inhale. And just feel the abdomen expanding and contracting with each breath. And let that feeling of the abdomen draw you into it more and more, breath by breath, feeling it expand and contract. And now recall your field of care, a caring moment or a benefactor with you here now or a spiritual figure or lineage. And experience that as present to you here with you now, not just a memory, present here with you happening now. Really happening. And you are being seen in your deep worth beyond judgments with deep care and compassion. And just relax into the feeling of that steeping in its loving energy, 
feeling its tender qualities and letting them infuse your whole being. Just accept this loving energy and its qualities into your whole body and mind. Every part of you loved in its very being. And now while continuing to feel the resonance of that care and compassion, bring to mind someone or some group whose suffering deeply touches your heart and sense or imagine the suffering that they must be experiencing and how it must feel for them in their mind and body what it must feel like for them. Just taking a little time to deepen your empathy in that way. But don't get stuck in the pain of this empathy. Instead, let the power of this empathy generate an intense compassion from your heart that wishes them free of all the suffering and deeply well. Feel the empathy, but let it translate itself into an intense power of compassion. It radiates from your heart, wishing them deeply free of all the suffering, deeply well. And let this strong wish and energy of compassion radiate powerfully from your heart to that person or group or being, infusing their whole being and environment in the healing power of compassion. Just wishing them deeply well and free of all the causes of their suffering, each in their own best way. So it's a powerful radiance of compassion from your heart going out to them and infusing their whole being and their whole environment in its qualities. Wishing them deeply free and well. And if you wish now, you can let this compassionate wish and radiant energy now extend 
more broadly to all beings who experience all the layers of suffering of living and dying in this world. Just infusing them all and their environment in the healing power of this radiant compassion. Wishing them all deeply well and free. Each in their own best way. Just letting this radiance of compassion extend itself now to all beings who have feelings. All beings who have layers of suffering. And wishing them deeply well and free. However that may unfold for each of them. And now finally just relax deeply into this felt sense of care and radiant compassion. Just relax into that and let that help your heart and mind to trust and release all of its images and frameworks of mind. And let the mind then just fall gently, completely open like space. letting the mind reunite with the natural openness that's already here beyond reference points or frameworks of mind like space and just let that unity of space and awareness do the meditating by letting everything be. And let patterns of thought and feeling that arise just unwind or release within this utter openness of awareness. This space of deep allowing and accepting by letting everything just be.
Thank you. Very good. So notice the instruction. <clears throat> Initially, we established again our secure core of love and compassion with the help of the field of care. And then we thought of someone or some group whose suffering really touches our heart. And we just took a little bit of time to deepen our empathy, sensing or imagining what it must feel like for them. And then came this key instruction. So at that moment, there are what are called two pathways that open up as we're empathizing with others and their suffering, others we really care about. We don't want to suffer that way. One pathway is the pathway of empathic distress, where our attention turns inward upon ourselves and we get caught up in the pain of our own empathy. Then we become disconnected, caught up, suffering in our own pain. We can no longer really be anywhere near fully present to others. The second pathway is the pathway that the instruction points us down, not that first one. The second one is the pathway of compassion, which takes the empathy and the energy of the empathy and even the energy of our own pain at empathizing with others who are suffering. It takes all that energy and translates it, transforms it into an intense energy of compassion and wish of compassion for them, which then radiates out to them. It goes outward to them. So we do not turn inward upon ourselves. This is a very simple, straightforward in instruction at the moment of choice. <laughs> it's basically saying, do not go down the path of empathic distress, go down the path of compassion. And here's how, and then it instructs how. So the instruction came, do not get stuck in the pain of this empathy. We're not trying to get rid of the pain. We're not trying to avoid the pain in any way. That's not the instruction. The pain of empathy is there if we're empathizing with someone who's suffering. That does bring pain. But now that pain can translate itself into compassion rather than making us feel overwhelmed by it. So it says, don't get stuck in the pain of that empathy. Instead, let the power of this empathy generate or engender an intense compassion from your heart that wishes them deeply free and well, and let that radiate out to them. So your attention and your energy is now pouring out, radiating out, not turned inward. And that's the key instruction to take empathy into the path of compassion instead of the path of empathic distress. The path of compassion that can take us then into, make us more and more fully present to others, responsive to others, take action with others, rather than the path of empathic distress in which we become overwhelmed emotionally exhausted and burn out. Those are two very different pathways. And the training in compassion has to be conscious of that, that there are two pathways and how to choose one over the other and go down that pathway, the one you choose. I'm emphasizing this because it, it seems to be so little taught anywhere that I've been aware of but it is part of these practices. So we let the loving energy from our own secure base of love and compassion guide our caring attention outward toward the others rather than turning inward on ourselves with the pain of our own empathy. And in that way, even painful aspects of our empathy become an energy of compassion for others. The stronger the empathy even the stronger the pain of empathy, the stronger the compassion. 
the more intense the empathy, even the pain of the empathy, the more intense the compassion. That's something that's worth knowing how to do. That is not by and large how medical doctors are trained. They should be, but there is not a lot of knowledge in how. So this practice points out a way how to avoid empathic distress, so-called compassion fatigue and burnout, and instead generate stronger and stronger compassion out of the same basic experience of empathy and care. There's another aspect to all this related to it, which is that often I think in our lives, the suffering of someone we know or hear about, like for example, on the news, as I'd mentioned in the newspaper, hearing it on the news, some intense suffering that someone or some group is going through. And that stirs powerful feelings of empathy in us that, are, that can be disturbing to us if we don't know what to do with those feelings. And so there can be a socially conditioned tendency to just try to suppress those feelings, deny them, change the channel. Because of the danger of getting overcome by empathic distress, overwhelmed by our own painful feelings at hearing of other suffering. You following? So in contrast, this meditation is showing us that we can actually convert even our most painful feelings of empathy into compassion and the more intense our empathy with those who are suffering, the more intense is the force of our compassion for them. We can actually learn that. That's a learning. We're not condemned to just have to fear empathic distress, not know what to do about it, and turn away from others when they're suffering or not want to know. We don't have to go on that way. There's another aspect of all this I also just want to raise up. In Buddhist psychology, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, but just to really raise it now, in Buddhist psychology, the strong will and wish of compassion that we were cultivating in a meditation like this is itself already an action. It is an action. That is, this strong, this intensifying will and wish of compassion, wishing them deeply free and well and free of the causes of suffering is a willingness to notice rather than turn away. It is a willingness to pay attention rather than not pay attention. It is a willingness to see what's before us, to be with those who are suffering, to hold them in care and compassion, to not turn away from them, to not leave them alone in their suffering. That deep will is already an action, a power, willingness to be present to. And that's the basis for any further action. That becomes the willpower and the motivation for all kinds of further action to address the suffering. I only bring that up because we live in a society that again, I think often does not see things this way at all. People feel called to get out there and act, meaning using their body and their voice. That's, of course, a great thing when it comes to addressing suffering. And not nearly as strong in our culture is an awareness that for us to act in a sustaining and sustainable way, to not just get recurrently discouraged and give up, emotionally exhausted, burn out and so forth, 
we need to access a sheer power and will of compassion. And that requires some discipline, some practice that brings forward, brings out, evokes, generates a strong force of compassion from our fundamental awareness, which then becomes a power of presence to those who are suffering or to everyone involved. And from that power of presence and from that strong will and motivation, all further actions. So that first step, what I just said, that is not attended to nearly as much in our society as far as I can see, sorry. Get out there and do it is attended to. That's where our attention is. Get out there physically and act. But what is the motive power, the motivational power and the will and the energy and attitude that is taking form in that action? How do you cultivate that? How do you generate that more and more strongly? That I don't hear about very much in our society. What I do hear about is an awful lot of people in all sectors of activity getting emotionally exhausted, depleted, experiencing compassion fatigue, feeling overwhelmed and endlessly asking each other, what can I do? What can I do about that? So I think that the practices like this that derive from really from powerful contemplative traditions have a lot to offer the world we find ourselves in right now. And anyone who seriously takes it up and takes responsibility to really train in it, cultivate it, catch on to it more and more, these powers of love and compassion and responsiveness and courage and groundedness and empathy and care and equanimity, anyone who's willing to really cultivate that to stick with it is holding something that's critical for the whole world around us. Because frankly, most people do not know that that even exists as an option, do not know how to do it. And instead are out there doing their best without that force, without that kind of a power of awareness and mind and presence for lack of anything in their education, teaching them how to cultivate that. So people are out there all over the place doing their best and unavoidably getting re recurrently overwhelmed So certainly it'd be good. I would hope that someone would be willing to cultivate this power of love, care, compassion, presence, and discernment. Learn to embody it more and more. Learn how to share it. And bring it into our schools of medical education and nursing education and counseling and therapy and police schools and everywhere else. So let me just sum up in our last few minutes of this session, what we've been engaging in over these seven weekly sessions. Is that okay? Just a very quick summary. In our first two meditations, our first two thirty Thursdays, it was on field of care, Handout Meditation 1 and 2, Deepening Receptivity to Love and Compassion. So those first two meditations, we learned how to establish a secure base or core of love and compassion and awareness with which to process our own feelings and from which to become more reliably present to others. In the second, 
the next two weeks, we explored the meditation of compassionate presence to feelings, which is number four in our meditation handout, and the meditation of letting be deeply, which is meditation number five. And with those, we learned to strengthen and deepen our secure base in spacious awareness. deepen and strengthen our secure base in the source of those loving qualities, in the spacious background of our awareness, which is also a place of deepening equanimity, ease of being. Then in the meditation of extending love, which is number six in our handout, you all remember that? Extending love one. With our secure base of love and awareness in place, we learned how to unblend compassionately from reactive parts of ourself to sense and respond to others in their fuller dignity and worth beyond superficial impressions and reactions. And in that way, that meditation of extending love, that's number six in your handout, begins to break down in-group biases to extend love and care more and more inclusively. And then based on all of those practices, we then took up the two compassion meditations last Thursday and then tonight. The first compassion meditation of last Thursday it's called taking our own sufferings or layers of suffering into compassion. It's number seven in the handout. And that showed us how to let our own layers of suffering draw us into empathic connection with others who harbor similar layers of suffering. Layers of suffering like loneliness, longing, grief of loss, fear of pain, fear for loved ones, fear of dying, layers of suffering that we share with all other humans. And by sensing those hidden layers in all others, including strangers and even those we have disliked, that meditation much further breaks down in-group bias. So our care and compassion for others can become much more inclusive. And then the second compassion meditation that I introduced tonight, which is number nine in the handout, shows us how to generate a quite intense willpower of compassion for action that explicitly avoids empathic distress, emotional exhaustion, compassion fatigue or burnout. Now those two compassion meditations that I just summarized are strong, can strongly empower our empathy for others and our compassion for them, but they are not complete just by themselves. To more specifically educate our empathy with what others are going through, we need to build relationships with others whose social and racial and ethnic and cultural or religious background, or gender or sexuality differ from our own. We need to build relationships with others who differ from us through many ways of coming to know each other, such as by opening new spaces for people to connect with each other and find their voice and also importantly through good literature and theater and film and other means of communication and illumination. It's a big part of what good literature does and the arts is educate our empathy. So for all these meditations that I introduced over the past seven weeks. Again, they were 
Specifically, they were adapted from traditions of Tibetan Buddhism and the particular traditions that I'm, have been mainly steeped in are Nyingma and Kagyu and Gelukpa. So it's drawing from all three of those, but the basic pattern of establishing a secure base in a kind of a, of a power and capacity of love and care and compassion to experience that you're held in that and let that experience evoke those powers from your own awareness. So you can learn increasingly to connect with that power of love and compassion more and more readily or even increasingly at will. That secure base has been found essential, not just in Tibetan Buddhism, but in all spiritual traditions I'm aware of. That is the kind of basis from which people then become present to many others with uh, increasingly reliable, sustaining, self-replenishing, inclusive and increasingly unconditional power of care, love, compassion, responsiveness, courage, discernment. The sort of thing that we've seen in figures like Martin Luther King, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, the Dalai Lama, Harriet Tubman. All of whom have practiced within that pattern, whether they've talked about it much or not, they have. <clears throat> experiencing themselves as held, which evokes their, the power of their being to hold others. That's the pattern we've entered into. It's not exclusive to Tibetan Buddhism by any means. So some of you have asked like, what about the video recordings of all these teachings and meditations, Thursday and Friday nights? And they've been up on our course website here with Barry, but they're also now, they'll be more permanently available on the website for the Foundation for Active Compassion. So I'm hoping that all of you by now know how to find that website. Am I correct? You know how to find it? It is listed on the first page of your meditation handout. It is foundationforactivecompassion.org. So on there are the video recordings. Also, just today, with others' help, the audio, the audio recordings of each of these seven meditations has also been put up on that website, on the media page. So for those who may wish to deepen in these practices over time, the ones that I've presented over these seven weeks, of course, this is a whole direction for cultivation over time. And I'm not assuming, in offering all this, I don't assume that everyone wants to take it up and make it their core practice for life, but some probably may want to. And then there are others for whom it may be empowering or helpful or informing in some way to the practice traditions that you're already practicing in. So that's my hope. But for those who feel a calling to really explore these practices that I just introduced and really deepen in them, then I do recommend selecting the meditation that's most opening for you and that and most grounding. And that's for most people that has been the from within the first two meditations to establish your secure base more and more stronger and stronger. And then from there, all the rest can flow more and more easily, all the other meditations. And you do the, rec the, do the meditation that is most connecting for you every morning and then reconnect with it or the spirit of it many times throughout your day. And that's what begins to really have an effect. And in my experience, nothing less than that really will. Sorry. Thinking of meditation as something, so like many people in our, in our culture have this misimpression, meditation is something you do what, you're supposed to do it for an hour in the morning or something? Maybe some people think that then, well, I'll do it an hour in the morning and a half an hour in the evening. And that, so I have a meditation practice. But to me, that's basically meaningless. I mean, it's, it's, I guess it's kind of good, but what do you, what's happening the whole rest of the day? I mean, the whole point of doing meditation is the whole rest of your day. It's not the meditation session. The point of meditation is not the meditation session. It's your whole day. 
So we need to be reconnecting throughout our day. It could be just in really brief moments, just a minute or two, here and there, here and there. If we do that, that's what begins to strengthen the neural connections. It begins to change our brain, if you will, from that sort of a point of view, from a neuroscience point of view. It requires a lot of repetition, but that's what starts to strengthen the neural connections in our nervous system for these ways of being. It requires repetition. And if we do it a lot, even just little moments many times in our day, it really will start to do that. but that takes its own time and patience. And that will build the foundation then to more easily engage all the other meditations. So what we did in this course was a bit artificial, you know, seven weeks, one meditation a week. We're not really necessarily ready for meditation six and seven after just a few weeks of the others. It's sort of, but there was introducing it all. There's the pattern. That's the direction. You see how the early meditations build on each other and establish the foundations for the later ones. And that's how it can also unfold in our lives for those who wish to take it up. The most crucial point, and this is my really my last point, the most crucial thing is not practicing on, on our own, not practicing alone, and not thinking of practice as something that we do even mainly on our own. That will not work. It's essential to practice with a mature practice community, with the ongoing input and support of a mature practice community. So for these practices, there, is, there are mature practice communities available through online practice groups, which are also available as a link on that Foundation for Active Compassion website. But what I'm saying is much more general. It's not just about the practices I introduced in this course any contemplative discipline, anything, it will not work if you think what you're doing it just on your own, that will not work. What will work is doing it with the support, with the ongoing support of a mature practice community. And that's the actual answer to all of your questions. So all these questions that I've been responding to every Friday, it gave the impression like that's how questions are answered. You ask the teacher and the teacher gives you an answer. But that's not how our questions are answered. In an ongoing practice over an increasing period of time, our questions are answered ongoingly in conversation with others, mature practitioners around us, many of whom have more experience than oneself, who have been through much of what oneself is experiencing and come out the other end of it and ongoingly give you input, respond to your questions. And then that outer, that outer source of wisdom and insight supports then increasing inner discernment, inner discernment from which, from which the questions really get answered, the inner discernment of your practice as you catch on more and more to it, it starts to not only raise questions for you, but answer them through your own insights that sort of open up in the midst of your practice itself. And suddenly you have an answer to your question that goes far beyond anything you could ever hear from anyone else, including your teacher because that inner dimension of your being is the real teacher. And any other teacher, is, if they're authentic, is just someone who learned how to catch on to that same inner dimension of their being that you're catching on to. So that's all I have to share for tonight. And I wanna thank, really give my thanks to Cassie and Jen who supported this whole online process so beautifully and care caringly. And I also want to thank Ilona and Elise and Kathy and Andrea who have helped compile the questions for the question and answer parts on Friday night. And I'll be back tomorrow night to respond to questions and questions you have. And I want to thank the Barry Center for Buddhist Studies 
and the Foundation for Active Compassion for all their support for this course and all the important work they do in the world. And I wanna thank all of you for showing up with such sincerity and care. Mm -hmm. And generosity really, to really offer yourselves really offer up more and more of ourselves to these possibilities. So I could really feel the power of your presence, feel the power of what it meant for you to, to show up this way. And I wanna thank you for it. That's all I have to say tonight. So thank you all. And good night.